Shalom, shalom, chavarim. Yes, I fraternal greetings. Salam to Tena Yisraeling. Greetings. This is Ras Yadin. This is Ayadonis here. This is Yadin. L O J, the Lion of Judah, Society of His Majesty. So I like to share with ones and ones, ones who might not have been familiar. Some we have spoken on this book previously. Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship. And we're talking about biblical. We're talking about real biblical scholarship, the other half of the story that hasn't been told. I'd like to firstly and foremostly give thanks again to Professor, we call him Professor, uh, Brother, Professor, Scholar, Bernard Lehman. This is Bernard Lehman's work right here, 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 that we like to share. Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. I'd like to thank him again. Hope all is well with him. You know, his family have not communicated to him in some years, but I'd like to thank him once again for giving the Lion of Judah Society the permission to reprint and publish this very, very excellent and important work. I mean, we can't really say enough about this without beginning to say something about this and sharing this book with others and encouraging ones to get a read. We have the PDF also available check out lojs.org that's lojs.org for lion of judah society check it out at the dot org also one can order encourage ones to get a hard copy right especially for the posterity and you know having the hard copies we know that the hard copies no doubt will outlive a lot of the digital but some digital will survive you know invest in both get the PDF the soft copy and also get a hard copy for the library for the posterity this particular book is going to be um, very much more important as ones grow you know we're all growing you know we're getting to know there's a lot of questions we're hearing out there especially amongst ones and ones who um, refer to the the black consciousness community and this is really the root by right? getting back to the Ethiopianness or getting back to the um, commandment keepers the 20s the roaring 20s from there the real roots by right? getting to the real roots of the matter and Dr. Bernard Lehman I, I call him Dr. Bernard though I don't see any title right here you know but definitely his research speaks for itself so here, I'd like to do a couple of um, videos on vlogs on particular subject matters and just zoom in on particular subject matters and some of the tools, right? Such as this particular document and here's his name right here. So ones and ones watching the vlog can see. And this is the publication that uh, roughly, I think it was, must be about 10 or maybe even more than 10 years ago we had requested you know permission to disseminate and to distribute it knowing that this book really needs to be read by others you know amongst you know the LOJ disciples the brothers and sisters and just others in general and it needs to be really put into the proper um, class of scholarship that it deserves and the, the author the researcher um, Bernard Lehman has done an excellent, uh, excellent job right here. And even recently, we were making reference in some of our studies, the Torah studies, the biblical studies, was making reference to this particular work. And we said, you know what? Let's do this. Let's have a vlog where we can just speak about this book, encourage ones to get a copy of this book, and also like to even just share a couple of, I think, a couple of pics of the author, at least a couple of pics that was in circulation some years ago. Okay, here he goes right here. All right, this is the author, right, Bernard Lehman, right, and his book here, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. This is like a 180 from the conventional. I think here is an Aksum, Wagshum, Aksum, right here. It's 180 degrees opposite of the pseudo Western Gentile academic consensus. In other words, he approaches this, you know, with the discipline, the discipline of what we call the academic, the scientific, the methodology, so forth and so on. But he's including data, 
and evidence that has been largely dismissed as we speak about the other half of the story. Right, the other half of the story. Usually when we hear about the biblical, you know, really do we hear of the Ethiopian, the manuscripts, right? Or the living descendants that are witness to this great history, right? Much less of us, the Beta Israel abroad here in the Americas and the Caribbean. So the other half of the story, this presents a very, very important other half of the story that's known to the so-called academic consensus. But because it puts into the, um, the narrative those peoples, right, those Ethiopian, Hebrew, Israelites of Ethiopia peoples that were a part of the original biblical narrative. So a lot of the questions that concern, you know, whether, you know, the Bible is true, whether it's history, you know, where's the evidence, you got to check out this particular book right here, 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 just sharing here. This is another document. Right. Um, I don't think we have a copy of it as of yet, but also getting into linguistics, right? The linguistics here, Sabian script on the second incense, the second Aishans, the second incense burner. Right now, the Sabian script is very, very interesting when we start talking about linguistics. And then some will say, well, um, a Hebrew is Canaanitish. Right before saying that Hebrew is Afro-Semitic, Kamo-Semitic, and the Ethiopia connection even in the linguistics. Even we see about the Queen of Sheba, right? The Queen of Sheba is very clear that the linguistic right here is Shemitic. Now, some believe that the Hamites were the only black ones in the narrative. We touched on this elsewhere and have a couple other vlogs to touch on it. But we maintain that the sons of Noch, right, according to the Hebrew narrative, were a melanated peoples and the diversity that we have in racial or so-called racial you know even this whole idea about white you know and the 17th century is when these ideas first really came about so they're very fairly recent so there's this older history and evidence that's being avoided and we give thanks to Bernard Lehman for bringing it to the forefront especially in this volume Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship which according to the author Right, is prohibited in certain countries. Certain countries prohibit this particular document. I think he mentioned Saudi Arabia, right, as well, because of what he presents, the facts, the hidden facts, right, and evidence that he presents here, right? Now, this too is interesting when we start to talk about linguistics, right, and the connection with Ethiopic. Really, the Ethiopic is more the root right of we could call it the biblical hebrew or has a lot to do with the formative roots besides all of that according to the plain hebrew science and knowledge of the the narrative they were brothers they were all descendants noah must have been speaking some language right that is at the root right of the languages of shem ham and japheth and the nations and descendants that come from there right but we're going to seek to debunk this whole um a kind of Canaanitish thing, right, that the Gentiles want to come with. This is interesting here. I just point to this quickly and move through it. We found this is Medales Phoenicianes, or like the Phoenician medals. Now, this is a drawing of what the medals are said to look like, but it's interesting to see the so called, um, the white European, right, the white Romanist or European features. And there is a difference. We've seen um, Romans that are black, we say black people. We're going to avoid saying they were black Africans because Africa and the terminology is a Roman terminology. We could say they were, they were Ethiopians if we want to identify, you know, a general um, racial kind of description. But here we're speaking about ones whose features bear a lot of similarity to what we know as Europeans. And they call these medals right here, medals, uh, Phoenician medals. Now, we don't know the providence of this, but we came across it and seeing some of the so-called paleo or old Hebrew script and, you know, then translated into, you know, more of the Asherit or the Masoretic. But just to note some of the, um, of the Phoenicians linked with the Romans, they look just like the Romans or at least the classical so-called Romans. You know, with the Phoenicians or the Phoenician of this period, Romans. It's interesting because we have the um, Galilee, right, in the New Testament of the Gentiles. It says Galilee of the Gentiles, of the nations, 
All right, so what we see even going on today, you know, regarding race and ethnicity, even among those who are Yehudi or who say they are Jews or who be a witness to being of Beta Israel is very, very interesting even to this very day. As they say, nothing new under the sun. But just to share this right there, we'll get into that. We're going to look up some more on that and just on the, some of the linguistics right here linking some of the linguistics but right here for right now we're going to touch on this book another point I'd like to touch on because these languages leaving some of this on the screen here we have some of the archaic the hebrew right and then we also have the hebrew as it links to like the nabataean right which is a dialect of aramaic and this is what was spoken right in the providence right of the queen of sheba right the queen of sheba so we can see the linguistic links right between the sabian right the sabian right and what we will refer to as the ethiopic as well and those afro semitic people when you say afro semitic people we're speaking about the the ham or ham right or kam right at the root of the Nile, and we're speaking about Shem. All right, so this idea that all three sons were antagonistic to each other and the peoples were antagonistic and there's no commonality is a false narrative. That's part of the white Anglo Saxon Protestant racist, right, or with racial, we could say, um, with racial, um, um, more like malice of forethought. Right within that, so just to show the linguistics, right? When we talk about the paleo and what's often left out of the Hebrew, the paleo Hebrew origins is its closest, um, we say related and relative language, right? That also have people, right? That speak these um, archaic languages or still maintain the knowledges of these archaic languages, and many of these archaic languages like Ethiopic have been used to help decipher areas of scripture and Bible. Even when we go into the Strong's Concordance and go into the roots of that, Gesenius, Gesenius, the lexicon, we find those relative facts. So this is part of the other half of the story. Here we're looking at archaic, you could say um, Ethiopic, and no doubt this was known both to the Sabians and also the Israelites of Ethiopia. As per, this is, goes to prove also the Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, right? It's the Solomon and the Queen of Sheba narrative. Now, here's some of the correspondence as they relate like to the Arabic, right? And we look at some of these right here, right? And what becomes very interesting when we look at some of these glyphs, which are Sabian, right? And are glyphs that are very much related with the, with the, the, the biblical Hebrew, Aramaic, as we showed in the previous slide. But when I look at these particular glyphs, South, Ancient South Arabian, the Queen of the South, the Queen of Shiva, get it? The Queen of the Ancient South Arabian script right here. We look at this and then we also compare this with the runes. I don't know if you heard about the runes. Um, Adolf Hitler, the, the, the Thule Society and other kind of stuff, Blavatsky and some of the other ones, they brought these ideas forward might even within the like 20th century you know concerning like the germanic and the nordic like runes what they call the runes the runes are these glyphs some say letters or symbols but when we look at some of the, those letters and symbols up in europe parts of europe immediately they remind us of the south arabian right the south arabian the language of the queen of sheba and then we know the links with the nabataean a dialect of Aramaic and therefore we have the Shemitic and also the Cushitic peoples here's how we get like the Hebrew you know here's how we get the Afro-Shemitic of the Hebrew in the same way that we get the Afro-Shemitic of the Amharic but now all of that is getting on a linguistic level but we point it out because ones like um, Bernard Lehman also goes into that within his document so I'd like to share a little bit about the Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship right here this particular document now this is this is on the back of the book let's do this right here just have a few exhibits to share right but let's first get to the book right here so the Queen of Sheba the imagery let's just touch on the imagery for a moment 
This is the picture that's commissioned by Gurmawi Nagus Negas, Moa and Bessazem Negede Yehuda, Gurmawi Kanamawi Hadaslasi, Siumi Exabi Nagus Negas, Ethiopia, His Imperial Majesty of Ethiopia commissioned this particular picture. So we say that this is, this is from our, the royal order, right? According to the royal order of Ethiopian Hebrews, this is one of the official, we could say, um, iconographies right of the queen of the south the queen of sheba known as negis makeda negis makeda makeda i know many ones may say makeda but it's coming from a western right enunciation in the ethiopic it's makeda makeda right known as makeda in the horn of africa right also in um, south arabia she was known as um the queen of sheba we know also as Ida, right? Ida in Ethiopia and in, in Israel, Yisrael in Israel, she was known as Ida. So a couple of different names just to also Belkis, 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 right? Among some of the Arabian tribes, just to point out the official iconography, you know, a couple of different versions right there, there, there. And we also note that, yes, there are other, you know, um, we say other other paintings, you know, and pictures of Makeda, right? The Queen of Saba, the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba. Now Makeda, the Queen of Sheba. Now there's a there's an interesting kind of dispute whether she was people some say, well was she Shemitic, they play this divide and conquer, was she Shemitic, was she Hamitic? Right? What if I told you she was Hamo Shemitic or Afro Semitic? Right? We know this because of linguistics and the peoples, right? Many of the ancient languages like Hebrew are actually Creoles, right? So as we study the history of the particular region, right? And this is all historically tested to. Therefore, we can trust the Ethiopic manuscripts and also the Ethiopic testimony. When we say Ethiopic, we're basically referring to both the Judeo, the Beta Israel side, and also many of those Israelites and other peoples, right, within the Orthodox faith, the true church and the professing church, the church of he who have the key of great King David, the church of Philadelphia, brotherly love, speaking about the Ethiopian Tawahedo church, the true church and the professing church. All right, so this is also one of the um, exhibits within um, the PDF has the color, some of the color images like this right here. This is one of the exhibits, right, within Bernard Lehman's work. I want to zoom in on this right here. I don't know how familiar ones and ones are with, um, you know, the region, the maps and everything. But here we see Solomon's kingdom area annexed after the Queen of Sheba's visit and held for 40 years. Right, so here is an alternative view, right, even based on other documents that are not usually accepted by the academic, the Western Gentile. Basically, it's still whitewashed. A lot, racism has severely affected a lot of their scholarship. You know, people say we're always speaking about this, but we have to speak about this because otherwise they would include other information. But this is not to say that all, you know, people of a certain race or group is that way. As we point out right here, the scholarship of Bernard Lehman, and he's getting a lot of fight on this scholarship. As we mentioned in this particular work, he said that this particular work, if we can find this here, yeah, this is, he had an introduction to the third edition January 2007. We'll return to this, but I just wanted to share that on the screen briefly, right, and check out some of the maps of the region, right, so we can get a better idea of what the Bible or what we have within the Bible. So some of these are the narrative right here. This is also, you can say, like a scroll, right, also witness, a scroll right here. This is how the region has been figured. You know what I mean? This is by European, you know, scholars. Who is this down here? No, they don't have a, a name on this, but you might have seen this. This is how some figure, you know. This is one of the, um, the iconographies within one of the churches and holy precincts concerning um, Negis Makeda, right? Based on the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, as she's pictured here riding on a horse. Right, the wondrous history of the Queen of Sheba. There's a book by Becca Menon. Right, a very nice, uh, very good. I like how they redid the picture, brought out some of the, 
you know, the contrast, right? Right there, there, there. Now, these are some other works, right? I'm not particularly recommending these other works, but not not recommending them. We basically share it here because we like to share it here because we need a, a book club, right? Line of Judah book club, right? You know, book study, you know, book, yeah, book club. So commend it for seeking. Uh, now, we'll touch on this as we get into the Queen of the South and what the scripture says. Even Yeshua refers to the Queen of the South in connection with the Second Advent and in connection with the eschatological judgment, right? Right, so right here, also some other eye traits, some other works regarding the Queen of the South and also the document, right? The geography is very, very important. Locations, the ancient locations. So here in Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship, there is a question concerning location. This is how some medieval Europeans pictured, you know, definitely it was thought that, well, the Queen of Sheba definitely is black. There does not seem to be much contradiction about that, right? Um, these are some other works here. This is how in some of the iconographies. Let's do this right here. But the written documents, right? Let's scroll down here. Here's what we're going to get to right here. This is the document we're talking about. Now, I want to share the back page right here. I don't know how clear it is, but like just to read through this right here. Apologies about the little blur, but let's read this right here so one can get an overview of why this book is so important. And hopefully, in upcoming vlogs, we'll touch on certain aspects, including the relocation. There's a question of whether old Jerusalem was where New Jerusalem is. New Jerusalem, in the sense of Jerusalem after the exile, the return from the Babylonian captivity. Not to get into those details here, but here, here, here. This book examines evidence connected with the life of Queen of Sheba, including the Sabian inscription on the Ethiopian plateau. Aspects of the Western, Slika, aspects of the ancient West Arabian language and geographical evidences in Ge'ez, Kivra Negas, right? The Kivra Negas to offer a third alternative, offer a third alternative. It argues, this book here, that the Old Testament is an accurate account, but its events took place in Western Arabia, not Palestine. This is, this is the crux of the matter, right? And no doubt controversial, no doubt all around. So it's about the Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship. And here in the edition that Bernard Lehman gave the LOJ Society, the Lion of Judah Society, permission to reprint and to republish, we're reading the, the back notes. Once again, let's go over the last part concerning this book, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship by Bernard Lehman. Here it says, the book, it argues that the Old Testament is an accurate account, but its events took place in West Arabia, not Palestine. It suggests that scholars are unwilling to consider such a strong possibility because, if true, it would not only completely undermine the raison d'etre, raison d'etre, like that's the, the French saying, a reason for being, the raison d'etre of the state of Israel, but also force a total reassessment of biblical Arabian and Northeast African history. All right here, we, we, we're getting into this right here. Is, is, is that passage right there that we just read? Hopefully, you can see this a little blurry, but I think it's still clear enough, hopefully, to read. All right? That's the first paragraph right there. So, you can understand why we say that this book is a very, very important document and it's for real scholarship concerning Ethiopia, the Israelites, the Bible, right? So this concerns the Ethiopian witness. It said Ethiopia, this man was born there, right? So here, 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 next paragraph right here, right? Professional, there we go right there, professional archaeology. Professional archaeology in the Holy Land dates from the 1920s. These are important facts here. 
professional archaeologists. So they talk about, oh, archaeology says this, such and such. And this is only going back, basically, we're in 2022. This is going back 100 years. Right? So professional archaeology basically just has barely just put on their knickers, so to speak. And has been characterized, reading on, by Jewish and Christian attempts to substantiate the biblical record. And, and may I say this right here, to just keep it a buck, by white Jewish and white, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, because that's who they were, right? Attempts to substantiate the biblical record. We have other peoples that also have a claim to these heritages, right? that don't go out their way to try to substantiate the biblical record. They, they know and they have faith and bear witness, some of them historically at the Beta Israel, Israelites of Ethiopia, other Israelites throughout the continent and elsewhere, and even us over here, the Beta Israel of the West. All right, so we just like to just add that particular part right there just for emphasis, right, that professional archeology span or Western Anglo-American archeology span has been characterized by, by Jewish and Christian attempts or white Jewish and Christian attempts to substantiate the biblical record. And well, if you are of, of, of this and you descended from people claim, why don't you believe that the, the, the scripture is true? But I guess, okay, let's go on. While evidence has been unearthed. So yes, there is evidence that does substantiate the Judeo-Christian, you know, um, biblical in that part of the world. Right? That supports the account of, but get this, the post-Babylonian captivity. This is speaking about the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? Account of the post, that's after the Babylonian captivity of the black Jews or the Judeans. Right? That had returned with the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? Well-known archaeologists such as Kenyon, right? Pritchard, Thompson, Glock, Herzog, um, Silberman, and Finkelstein, or Finkelstein, have concluded that the Old Testament is either a fantasy or highly exaggerated. And this is where a lot of these pseudo scholars, even some of them, you know, whether they're pro Kemetic and anti Hebrew or anti Israelite, they're basically regurgitating a lot of a lot of that rabble from these so called well known archaeologists. Right, that have come to a conclusion, it seems as like a, a, a conspiracy on a certain level. What we think, right, based on the evidence that we have, is that they found certain things that basically show and prove not that they were in the land, ethnically speaking, but that others was in the land, ethnically speaking. In other words, we think that they're finding archaeology that proves a lot of, you know, the Israelite you know, the Hebrew, the black Jewish point, and they're just suppressing it, right? And this is known to have happened by right, many times before, right? All we need is a whistleblower to basically say, yes, it is correct. They found certain things that prove the Israelites are black people, boom, right? And we already have other evidence of it, but these ones and ones, let's go on. Joshua's invasion of Canaan has been reinterpreted so a lot of the fight against the Bible and heal up to um, Pharaoh say that the elder like to get an interview with the elder Pharaoh say that you know reason man. you know for I and I to reason right Pharaoh say that he, I think he had a video a, a, a stream that was like the hate like within the so-called black conscious community so-called right especially the ones online on YouTube says it's hate for the Bible Right? This is all part of this reinterpretation because once I have to recognize that when a lot of, you know, black students have either gone to, you know, um, colleges and schools after some of the victories, so to speak, of former black Americans and generations for education and so forth and so on, that, you know, um, some have advocated separate but equal, others want an integration. So we got integration and part of, it's like Bob Marley said, you know, um, building more um, um, churches and universities, graduating thieves and murderers. But because what's happening is they're getting miseducated. Right? As it says right here, Joshua's invasion of Canaan has been reinterpreted right? based on these pseudo but very popular scholars that look at the Old Testament as either a fantasy or highly exaggerated based on what they either have found or not found. 
right, that Joshua's invasion of Canaan has been reinterpreted as a peaceful migration. This is what we hear ones like Garfield on Sarnetta's platform, his own platform, and others, and even in his book that he wrote, right? That's why we present Bernard Lehman's scholarship here, because this is scholarship with, with much enough references, right? You know, bibliography, um, primary sources, you know, secondary sources, tertiary sources, if you want to go there, sources for bibliography, right? Well laid out work right here. But let's just go over this again. So Joshua's invasion of Canaan, right, nowadays, right, so-called 100 years later, right, has been reinterpreted, right, as a peaceful migration and traces have been found of the massive public works allegedly contracted in Jerusalem by Solomon or in Samaria, that's the northern kingdom, by Omri, right? If they existed, they would have been little more than petty village headmen with imaginative publicists. This is how it has been said now. So that, so even when ones go to certain ones who either, you know, are Jewish or, you know, that's what they say, they're Jewish, right? They, they say, well, we're Jewish, we're in the state of Israel, we found this, and, and people will be like, well, they're, they're the Jews, you know? Look, they say they're Jews, and they're over in the state of Israel, and they haven't found it, and they're saying this, right? So how can these black you know, Israelites or Hebrews and black Jews, how can they be saying this? How can the Ethiopian Hebrews and the Israelites of Ethiopia, the Beta Israel at home and abroad be saying these things? So just to understand what we're dealing with and also how we can suit up and boot up, right, by getting more accurate scholarship. So they say if they existed, speaking about Solomon and even Omri, they would have been little more than petty village headsmen with imaginative publicists. Right? This so-called minimalist, this, uh, they, they call this in academic fields a minimalist, right? Minimalist. You know, like you've done something, everybody knows it's a great work, but people are jealous or envious of you, so they want to say, like, you only did a little something. They try to minimalize it, make it less than what it really was. This minimalist outlook is fiercely challenged by others who believe that the evidence to support the Old Testament has literally yet to be uncovered. And we are of that group right there, right? It says contend earnestly. And we say that not only uncovered as far as archaeologically, but, but, but um, kind of declassified. A lot of things that they have found, they have just put up in universities. You know, we speak about what happened with the Beta Israel, those who were brought to the state of Israel with a lot of their books and manuscripts, very ancient books and manuscripts they brought on planes that was taken and put in certain places like Hebrew University or other centers. And many of the Beta Israel in the state of Israel have been arguing for access to their ancient manuscripts. Right? So we know that there is evidence, but only a trickle really gets out. And this is what makes Ethiopia might significant right especially with the israelite the connection royal order ethiopian hebrew historical over three thousand year connection the ethiopians with their manuscripts right and so many generations of manuscripts right and even the recopy of manuscripts to keep that knowledge and that evidence in circulation in fact what ethiopia has done over the past three thousand years and even over the past, we could say 2,000 years, with keeping manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, right, in circulation, right, keeping this knowledge in remembrance, and also having that independence and ancient sovereignty, we say because of that Solomonic, you know, Davidic, that covenant, right, and that Torah, that covenant, you know, keeping perspective, you know, was able to maintain its borders. And yes, we have the Battle of Ottawa. Yes, we have also the Makadala. Yes, we have the fascist invasion, right, in the time of the blessed, the only potentate, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, Kedemah, Hala Selassie. Yes, we have those kind of incursions, but overall, over a period of more than 3,000 years, right, there's a wealth of information even new manuscripts came out recently over the past 10 years that we heard some professional um, 
um, scholars in the Western Gentile, you know, Anglo-American academia that I think they said something like, wow, like, like, almost like they saved the best for last. You remember when Yeshua changed the water to wine and somebody at the, at the wedding, they said, oh, you know, to the master of the wedding, they said, you saved the best wine for last. So that even showed that they had these particular documentations, right? you know, that wealth of information. You see, if Ethiopia, whether it was the Magdala with, uh, with um, uh, Emperor Teodros Theodore, right, in 1868, right, whether it was the Battle of, of Ottawa, right, even after that, or the fascist invasion, if any one of those were su successful, as they attempted to be, we would have lost these. These manuscripts would have been hidden away in some university somewhere, and they would have been telling us, we the black people of the world, that we have no contribution, no part of the scripture, no part of Israel. They would basically, as Psalm 83 says, to make the name of Yisrael no more in remembrance among the people who are ethnically Yisrael. Right? This is our claim. Right? By accepting, last part of this right here, by accepting African traditions in providing a solution to the bitter division in biblical scholarship, this book ranks with Martin Bernal's Black Athena. I don't know if you heard about the Black Athena. Remember back in over 20 something years ago, there were some things at Brooklyn College concerning the, the Black Athena in its degree of controversy or controversy and presenting, here's the key, controversy, you know, you could, there, there, could, there could be a, a controversy about anything, but here's the key, right? And presenting evidence that most scholars should address. So now it's time for us to suit up and boot up on this additional evidence, right? And present it. Right? Even amongst certain ones and ones in the black consciousness community and these ones and ones like the Garfields and the others that would like to go against the biblical narrative and support the consensus scholarship, right? that even concerning the Bible, right, from their perspective, is only a hundred years at most old. Right? And we do know that ones and ones have their own malices of forethought. But we'll get into that elsewise. So right here, 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 once again, to share this particular work right here, encourage ones to, you know, get a, a, a copy. Now, some of these are other related books right here, but speaking about the Queen of Sheba, right? Queen of Sheba, the book is called The Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship, right? Just showing some of the icons, the iconographies right here, you know, the different portrayals some indigenous, some outside of the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, you know, as well as some other related Ethiopia images. Now, you see right here, this is the key, the writing, right? The writing, right? We always uh, ask about manuscripts. What about the Ethiopian manuscripts? Something that the scholars or the Western Gentile scholars do, they like to late date things, you know? In other words, because we have a manuscript, that might be only dated 500 years ago. That does not mean that this manuscript was made up 500 years ago. What is likely and what is the fact is that the manuscripts had to be copied every so many years because in a climate like Ethiopia with rainy seasons, you know, um, you know the different seasons, this affects manuscripts and, 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 and scrolls written on animal skin, these things have to be renewed, otherwise that information be lost. It's not like ancient Egypt, which is, you know, dry as, as, as Uk, you know, it's a dry country, ancient Kemet. So this is why it's preserved much more. Remember the waters that Kemet needed for survival came from Ethiopia. So in such an environment like Ethiopia, ancient manuscripts often had to be rewritten or kept in places like highlands, monasteries, other places, you know, like above um, sea level and everything like that. And anybody who knows about this is like when they get certain manuscripts, they have to keep them in certain temperature controlled places in order to preserve it, right, over time, 
right so the queen of sheba right so here 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 we'll touch on some of the details as we go on once again just to give ones and ones you know the cover right here right you try to present maybe the link for that book you know um so ones can order it you know also support LOJS, some of the works, but also give thanks to the scholar here, to Bernard Lehman for this excellent work. And we just shared right here, just a basic overview. Oh, there was this part we was gonna share, right, concerning this work, the introduction to the third edition, January, 2007, right? So we have, I think this is the third ed edition right here. This is on page VII page seven vii it says introduction to the third edition january 2007 it says readers should be warned that possession of this book has led to arrest in saudi arabia i want to point out this particular work here by bernard lehman right the fuller full of the book cover right here readers should be warned that possession of this book this book Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship has led to arrest in Saudi Arabia. There has been also, there has been also, right, a strong clandestine campaign to block its sales, the sales of this particular book. That's why most ones haven't heard. They've heard a lot of different books about Queen of Sheba, this and that, and some people just making up stories or all kind of stuff. Right? But there's some serious scholarship that is based on the actual, we could say, Queen of Sheba archives and manuscripts, right, preserved on both sides of the Aden, the Aden, like the Garden of Eden, the Aden of the Gulf of Eden, both on the Ethiopia side, the Horn of the Continent, right, as well as on the Arabian, so-called Arabian side. But there has been a strong clandestine campaign to block the sales of this book queen of sheba and biblical scholarship internet say sites there are internet sites out there that falsely claim it was published by africa world press all right so there are internet sites out there this is what the author has in the um i think this is the foreword here with the last part of the this is the introduction, in the introduction, right, of Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. The author says that there are internet sites that falsely claim that it, speaking of Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship, was published by Africa World Press at more than $100 a copy, but is now, quote, not available. So they do this with a lot of works. We pointed this out with Archbishop Yitzhak's work. Um, that work, Ethiopian Tawahedo Church and Integrally African Church by Archbishop Yitzhak, a very vital work, right? And it seems like they do this with the really, really good books, right? With the really, really good books. We say this as of the Ethiopian Tawahedo Church, the book by the late Archbishop Yitzhak, whom Kedamawi Hanna Selassie sent over here for I and I, and also with this particular book here by Bernard Lehman, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. So once again, readers of this particular book should be warned that possession of this book has led to arrest in Saudi Arabia. There has been a strong clandestine campaign to block its sales. So hopefully ones will like, share, you know, subscribe, but definitely share this, post it, repost it on there. Also, we're gonna get the links for the upload right so look in the description right internet sites out there that falsely claim it was published by africa world press at more than a hundred dollars a copy that's one thing that they do they'll raise the price archbishop yitzhak's book the ethiopian tawahedo church an integrally african church we've seen that published on some sites out there for seven hundred dollars one for nine i think even beyond a thousand dollars right whether hard copy or soft copy is, is, is crazy, but they do that as to kind of like prevent ones from having a copy of the book because they, they do that to discourage, you know, discourage the availability of the book, right, at such high, you know, such high prices. Because sometimes if they say $100, somebody say, hey, I'll, I'll put a, you know, I'll put a bill on it, right? And then they recognize, uh-oh, 
so, so say say a thousand dollars you know what I'm saying and then it limits you know what I'm saying the type of people that could purchase the book and therefore control that knowledge and after all don't they say knowledge is power so you know get the power of understanding the truth of the Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship a very important book for the LOJ the line of Judah um, book club right very very important book and once again let's just sum up right here with um, brother Bernard Lehman right here right we have Bernard Lehman the author of this book right hope and pray he is all well and this is him right here in Ethiopia and he has Ethiopian sources here right even getting into the gutters right even getting into the cover and the guest right so very 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 important work right here get a copy and you know make I and I come together in the book club and let's reason right come make a reason on this this is Ross Ayadonis Tafari co-founder one of the co-founders of LOJ society right here 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 LOJ check us out at LOJS.org also like share and subscribe to the channel you know that you're viewing the full of full of this right hopefully Rastafari Jews and also elsewhere as well we'll see to get the link for the book and put the link in the description so check the description and also help to share and repost because we really need to get you know ones and ones of us you know all to kind of read and study this book so we can you know iron sharpen iron one hand washes the other and both hands wash the face once again give thanks to Bernard Lehman for this work and also for the opportunity of the LOJ the line of Judah to republish this particular book and here we're seeking to even get it more into circulation right because we've had this book for a while and only very few ones and ones but perhaps we need to you know um, advertise it you know what I mean you know advertise let people know what it's about and hopefully following up we'll get into certain particular areas that's very very interesting in fact we'll leave the eye then with this one right here concerning the maps right 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 here let the eye kind of look at that right there that might be one of the reasons why the book is um so-called like outlawed or ones got arrested right because here he's proposing that the location right not just he but the evidence and others also they're finding much evidence that's actually Israelitish and Hebrew in this particular region right of what's known as Arabia further south right of what we call today Levant and Palestine so this is an interesting um, development and then we can also see the link right of where the possible ancient Israelite Old Testament kingdom was or even an extension of the kingdom right you know the extension of the kingdom even with Egypt there is the upper and the lower even with the continent that was formerly known as Ethiopia but now the pseudonym Africa we had upper Ethiopia and lower Ethiopia so why could not this also be right with ancient Israel right as well as you know like ancient Israel so what we're seeing here on the map is almost like upper Israel and Judah and then the lower Israel and Judah this is what we propose right here but we're gonna leave you with this right here just a kind of a visual right to see the full of full of it right and also you can see some of the dates and the times right the connection of the dates and the times right here there's some ones who are trying to dismiss this truth because once you get to see this truth as Bernard Lehman said right here um, this book argues that the Old Testament is an accurate account but its events took place in Western Arabia not what we call Palestine or the Levant today and this book it suggests that scholars are unwilling to consider such a strong possibility because for a reason because if it's true and if they consider it and they bring forth all this evidence that's also being brought forth in this document here that is true it would not only completely undermine the ratson detra the ratson detra the reason for being of what we know today as the state of Israel but also force a total reassessment reassessment of biblical Arabian 
and also of Northeast African history. And we see about Northeast African history, right? Here's the connection with Ethiopia, right? With Ethiopia. And what we coin the phrase the Israelites of Ethiopia, speaking of those 1,000 from each of the 12 tribes, the 12,000 that returned with Dagmawi Dawit, with David II, Baina Lechem Ibn Hakim, the son of the Queen of Sheba, and King Solomon, Melech Yisrael, the King of Israel at Jerusalem. At Jerusalem. So here, 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 yes, I, yes, I, Sheba, Israel, Judah, right? And we also have scriptures for that. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Yes, I. Shalom, Chavarim. Yeshua, Shalom.